I just feel like I've had so much to grapple with and I'm just like afraid and sad that YouTube, welcome newbies and welcome back good friends. You're watching my channel Aesthetic Academic. My name is Ashima and I'm a medical student that loves fashion and I also love pondering the philosophical quandary of aesthetics. I started this channel because a few years ago I actually got kicked out of university and then a few years after that I managed to get accepted into a medicine degree at Australia's best university and I thought that was an underdog story of success that was worth sharing. So subscribe to my channel if you want to feel good about dreaming big, irrespective of how you've performed in the past. Today's video is a Q&A answering all the questions I got via Instagram about getting into medicine. So let's get into it. Did I have a mentor to get guidance and advice from? No, but that is a huge reason that I decided to start this channel. Getting into medicine is easier if you know someone who's already in medicine or you have someone to get guidance and advice from because it makes the whole ordeal feel a lot more realistic and achievable. Medicine is much stronger when we have doctors from all walks of life. So I'm striving to be everyone's online mentor. I reply to all of my comments and all of my DMs. You can literally comment on any of my videos, any of your med questions, and I will answer them. It can be really comforting to hear that someone has faith in you and I have faith in you. So please don't be afraid to reach out and ask me any questions that you have. I am so happy to answer them. I learned everything about what I needed to know to get accepted into medicine online. I tried to stay away from forums like Paging Doctor because I felt like they weren't really good for my mental health. Um, they felt very braggy, just lots of people who apparently got like, you know, like 85 gamsats and did made me feel very inadequate. So I stayed away from those. I just focused my attention on the official websites from universities and their MD pages. And I dissected every one of those pages multiple times during my undergrad. That was my procrastination um, activities that I did. I just go online and read all their MD pages. So that is a really, really good thing that you need to do and get in the habit of doing because you don't want to miss out on a prerequisite or something really important um, and disadvantage yourself that way. How to cope with self-doubt. So this is something I still struggle with from time to time and definitely, definitely struggled with in undergrad. So any feelings of doubt that you have generally come from what you don't know. And for me and a lot of other people actually, that doubt was, am I good enough academically? Like, do I have the brain power to be a doctor? And because you can break down your academic ability into two prongs. So you've got your intrinsic ability or your IQ or however you want to think about that concept, but then you also have your work ethic part of it. Like how hard are you willing to work? How conscientious are you? So I don't know my IQ. You know, there's no real good way to measure your IQ. You can do a test, but that doesn't really tell you anything. And it's honestly just like a big waste of time because who really cares? It's less important. So what I did was I focused more of my attention on just being the best, most hard worker that I could be. And for me, that meant um, most every day I would study for between eight and 12 hours. Um, I would always complete my work to the highest standard that I could complete it. And that way, firstly, I didn't even have the time to worry about whether or not I was sufficient. And then the more confident I got and the better I got at working, I, this doubt started to be less and less because then I got feedback and I was doing well. So just focus your attention on the parts that you can control, which is how hard you're working. And I promise you that is more than enough. You don't have to worry about the rest of it because so long as you work hard and smart, you will get the grades that you need to get. I also really spent time training my brain to think about what I was good at instead of what I wasn't good at. Being a doctor, I can roughly chop up 50-50 into intellect and communication. They're both vital skills in medicine. And I knew I was a good communicator. So instead of wondering if I was going to be smart enough, I focused on the part and I always talk to myself about how good I was at communicating. I would say stuff to myself like, oh, you know, I might not be as smart as some people that I know or like other people applying for medicine, but I definitely know I'm a great communicator. So, so long as I can meet the standard of the academic part, then I'm going to shine in the communication aspect of the job. So that is going to be wonderful for my patients. They're going to love that I can communicate with them very well. It's not even going to matter that I'm maybe not as 
I choose smart as my peers. And I just made a point of repeating that to myself as often as I could, anytime that I had thoughts of not feeling um, very confident in myself. So I do advise you to focus on what you're good at already and remind yourself of those skills and why you are going to be a good doctor because of those skills and focus on that part. I'm going to merge two questions together here about motivation and what I do to stay motivated and what you can do as well. Just in case you get the impression that everything is sunshine and lollipops and I'm always feeling motivated, it's definitely not the case. This is a clip that I filmed last year when I was thinking about starting a channel but didn't really quite know how to organize it. Um, and it was in the trough of my motivation. I had no motivation at all. I want to show that everyone has bad days and you can still achieve everything you want, even when it feels hard and what strategies I implement to cope when things are getting really hard. So basically I've just had some ongoing issues with my health for the last couple of months and I haven't been able to use my hands. Um, they, they've just been aching for the last few months, um, even just doing like basic household stuff. Um, by the end of the day, my hands are extremely sore. So it's been really difficult because um, when I study, I write, like I write as I watch my lectures and I haven't been able to do that. Today I've just been, like I have an assignment due tomorrow, but I just literally couldn't do it today. Um, I, like I know I have enough time to get it done this evening, but I just woke up this morning and I was just feeling so down and really defeated. I just had to watch Kath and Kim and cry for like four hours before I could even feel okay about like going out and do anything for the day. No one knows, I don't have a diagnosis yet for um, what my, where my pain is coming from, but if it's sort of what I'm thinking it might be or my doctor thinks it might be, um, it could like affect the traje trajectory of my whole life. Um, it's been really difficult to grapple with because um, like I just feel like I've had so much to grapple with and I'm just like afraid and sad that uh, it will um, like have a really big effect on my life and I'll have to like I just want I just don't want everything that I work for to be in vain like to not be able to use my hands <laughs> because um, I've just had to work really hard <laughs> to even get to the point where I am now um, and there's just been so many obstacles and hurdles um, yeah I just don't know how I'd cope <laughs> if it was um, ended up being something about my health that I couldn't change. So yeah, that's been really hard. Um, but I don't have a diagnosis yet, so I shouldn't spend too much time being upset about that. Uh, watched a lot of Kath and Kim, and now it's about three o'clock and I'm gonna go to the library and hopefully get it stuck into some work. I tried yesterday for a little bit, but my hands were just in um, excruciating pain by the end of it. Like I just couldn't, I was just sitting at the keyboard, um, just crying. So I was like, okay, I um, should probably go home now. Um, but they're feeling um, a little bit better this morning. So hopefully I'll be able to get it done. But I'm sure it'll be fine. I mean, I hope it'll be fine. Uh, I have a lot to be grateful for. Uh, my boyfriend is freaking amazing. He's so funny and so nice and helpful. Um, and I have my dog who's the best. And I am a smart and hard worker, so uh, there's no reason that I won't be able to navigate this obstacle as well. But I think I just needed to talk about it because I was feeling really heavy and down. But I feel, I'm feeling better. I think that learning to recognize when you need a day off is a really vital skill. There's going to be those days where you feel like everything is a disaster and no matter what you try, you won't be able to get any work done that day. So it's best if you recognize that sooner rather than later. So then you can have the whole day off and actually properly relax. And then with any luck, the next day you'll be feeling a lot more rejuvenated. I fall into a pattern sometimes of waiting till the end of the day where I've 
um, sat at a desk like for like five hours and haven't completed any work and then I go to bed and I feel so disappointed because I've not had any fun and I've not done any work either so I've achieved nothing I haven't even achieved relaxation so now I do try to focus on I write a diary in the morning and if I'm already at that point of the day feeling really tired and like I'm not going to get any work done I generally just call it a day and have the day off and then do something fun like play with my dog or do something else enjoyable like binge watch reality tv so just don't be afraid to take days off also find ways to reward yourself for every teeny little accomplishment that you have during undergrad we had a lot of one percent quizzes like every week and I rewarded myself after every single one of them. I would either go out for a meal or have a, watch a movie, just whatever I could really afford that week. Um, for you, it can be like having a bath with a bath bomb or some sort of self-care. Just remember to reward yourself for every step of the way because it's tough. And if you don't have those little things to look forward to, it's gonna get very old very quickly. Another one that I do, which is impossible right now, is I always have a music event or a festival booked in. So when I look through my planner, like I'm excited because I've always got something to look forward to and a way to reward myself that way because I really like going to music events. So I love this question because I think motivation is what separates successful applicants from unsuccessful applicants because everyone has periods of feeling demotivated. You know, no one's feeling motivated 24 seven. So it's your ability to figure out how to stay motivated, which is what's going to put your application in front of someone else's who maybe doesn't have the capacity or the discipline to work through those periods of demotivation. I'm also putting another two questions together here. How important are extracurriculars and did I write a personal statement? So out of the 12 postgraduate medical schools in Australia, only three are portfolio universities. University of Wollongong, University of Notre Dame Sydney and University of Notre Dame Fremantle. At the portfolio unis, your extracurriculars are very important because that's some of the judging criteria for whether or not you'll receive an interview. So that's why that's important. So for every other university or the non-portfolio universities, it doesn't matter if you have any volunteer or work experience for getting you to the interview stage because there's nowhere in the application for you to actually submit that information. It's exclusively judged on GPA and GAMSAT. However, once you're in the interview, I think it is vital to have some extracurricular volunteering or work experience to discuss in your interview. And that is what is going to make your interview an outstanding interview. The skills you learn and the scenarios that you'll go through in your um, extracurricular activities is what is going to give you the meat of your answer in your interviews. And it's going to give you examples when you do need to call upon them. It's very obvious when you lie about stuff like that. So please don't do that. I recommend you do get the experience and figure out if you even like working at a hospital. Did I take multiple GAMSATs and how long did it take me to prepare? So I did the GAMSAT twice and I ended up applying with my first school because it was a better school. And I started reading The Economist about 12 months out from my first sitting. And then about three or four months out from the exam is when I started to do practice questions all the time. When I had uni, I would do one full day a week of questions, like eight hour day or on a Saturday or something. And then every day I would write an essay and that's how I prepared for the first one. For the second one, I actually did a GAMSAT course and I studied way more and way more often and I got a worse score. Which leads me into my next question, which is do I have any GAMSAT courses that I recommend? The answer is a strong no. This question really touched a nerve because it takes me back to this awful time of last year where I got caught up in the hysteria of biomed because being in biomed really makes you feel like you need to do a GAMSAT course to do well just because everyone else is doing one. So it does make you feel like you might be disadvantaged if you don't do it. So I took it alone because I had no money. I had some really god awful correspondence with the company as well even though they were one of the more popular GAMSAT companies. Just really rude interactions, so already starting on a bad note. And it was horrible. Every one of you has been in the class before. And you just know that if you're in a class with more than just you, you're not going at your pace. You're going at the average pace of the class, which is not your pace. You could be going faster in sections that you need more help or slower in other sections. So you're really never going at an ideal pace for more than one person. So I found that although I was spending all these hours, like every day, apparently studying for the GAMSAT, I was probably doing about one eighth of the amount of work that I could be doing by myself and moving at the pace that I needed to be at. 
It was also just a cesspool of anxiety. I love everyone I met through that course. That was my favorite part of the course, meeting all the lovely people. But it was just everyone's anxious feelings synergizing and just amplifying that feeling all of the time. So any confidence you had in yourself just goes out the window because you're feeding off the energy and the vibe of the room. So for that alone, I feel like definitely don't do the course because you don't want to be surrounded by tense thoughts. You want to be surrounded by as calm things as you possibly can. I'm not even comfortable on camera saying what Gamsat course this was because I've literally seen them online berating their critics because my theory is they're such an awful course. This was not a unique experience to me that their way of trying to keep their business running is to berate their critics, which works and it makes me feel scared to speak out about them. But definitely message me on Instagram and I can tell you what course that was so you can save your penny and go somewhere else if you do choose to go down that path. So I do not recommend Gamsat courses, but having said that, I do recognize that everyone learns very differently uh, and that is just one opinion, but I wholeheartedly do not recommend them. What are my favorite study resources? So I am a big fan of my uni lectures and also YouTube. So I always watch my uni lectures multiple times because I definitely know that the information that I'm getting out of them is accurate. I then go back through my lectures and supplement the knowledge that I've learned from them with YouTube videos. But when you are learning stuff off YouTube, obviously you can't take it for face value because it hasn't been verified or peer reviewed or anything like that. So if I'm watching a YouTube video, say about a cellular mechanism or something like that, I will always have a textbook with me um, just to verify that data. And I'm not loyal to any textbooks. I don't buy textbooks, so I just go to the library and just pick up whatever book I can see. The first book about microbiology, I can see I'll get that one. And then that's how I cross-reference what I'm learning from YouTube. So yeah, the free resources are my favorite resources. Top five books that I've learned the most from. So I actually never read books to learn. I read books for fun because I feel like in this day and age, if I'm reading at all for any reason, that is better than not reading at all. So I can't say that I've read anything that I've learned a lot from. I do most of my learning from my uni lectures. The top five books that come to mind that I've really enjoyed over the last few years is The Ghost Empire by Richard Fiddler. This one is about the rise and fall of the Roman Empire, which is outstanding. Sapiens by Yuval Noah Harari, which is about the history of humanity. Um, then I also really enjoyed The Arsonist by Chloe Hooper. If you're Australian, this is a book by the reporter who reported on the Black Saturday fires, which was actually started by arson. Very, very interesting read and very, um, uh, it makes you feel a lot because they go into accounts of like people who are actually in the fire and it's very, I've never heard that perspective before and I found it very gripping. And then I also really like The Rosie Project. The Rosie series is fantastic. Um, it is about a gentleman who has autism and his quest to find love. It's just a very sweet and beautiful read. And I also really loved This Is Gonna Hurt by Adam Kate. If you haven't read it, please do. It is so funny. I was laughing out loud that entire length of the book. It's about a doctor in the UK who is an obstetrician and he's just very funny. And he writes about his insights from being an obstetrician and it's just very well written. He has a comedy career now, so that's how hilarious that book was. What were my main factors in deciding what medical school I wanted to go to? So because I completely support myself financially, the biggest deciding factor for me was proximity. Because I completely support myself financially, proximity was the biggest factor for me deciding where I wanted to go to school. When I first re-enrolled in Biomed, um, I didn't think I was capable of getting into the schools that were local to me. So I, was, I went into Biomed basically knowing that I'd have to move interstate, which didn't end up happening, but that's what I thought because I just didn't think I was good enough. But as I received marks and grew more confident in myself and saw what I was capable of doing when I applied myself, I readjusted my thoughts and realized that I did have a good shot at getting into the schools that were local to me, the ones I wanted to go to. And after four years of being the brokest person alive and struggling financially while I was studying my undergrad, I realized that while I could do it for medicine as well. It would really detract from my happiness to have to study and then work and then never see my boyfriend, have to fly into state. Like I knew I could do it because I've struggled before and been fine and made it, but I just didn't want to have that struggle anymore. So in Victoria, where I am, the University of Melbourne is the only university in our CBD. So that's where I decided to go to medical school. 
did I put down all Victorian universities? Yes, I did only put down Victorian universities. And following on from what I was saying before, so I think I definitively decided that I wasn't going to apply for interstate universities when it came to the application time because I was filling out the applications and I was like, do I want to put interstate universities? And then I started calculating how expensive it would be to just go to that interview and come back from the interview and get a hotel. And it just, the, the maths wasn't adding up. Like I wasn't able to work enough to even orchestrate that happening, let alone actually moving interstate and worrying about finding a job, finding a lease agreement somehow only for eight months. Um, and then flying back to see my boyfriend. And it was, it was just, if it was too expensive for me to go to the interview, it was definitely too expensive for me to live there. If you still live at home, you might not know this, but moving house is a massive expense and it's actually a lot more expensive than you think it's going to be. So I've moved house every year for like five years. I definitely know how expensive and how grueling it is. So I didn't want to put myself through that. If you have the financial backing of your family and you've never lived out of home, I think moving interstate would be really fun and a great move if you have nothing tying you to the state that you're in. But just remember that medicine is super hard. You're going to need a network of people to help you through it. And so that's just another thing that you'll have to factor in if you do move into state, that you have to build those networks for yourself again. But if you're happy to do that and you have nothing really holding you back, I think that's a really cool challenge and you'll learn a lot about yourself that way. But if you are trying to support yourself, definitely easier to be local. How did I effectively study for the GAMSAT? I think my best advice for this is to prioritize section two because that is where you can see the biggest changes very rapidly. So if, you, if you're limited on time, I do focus my attention on section two. I wrote an essay every day um, for a few months leading up to the exam. I only did timed practice questions. That was most of my studying. I would, there would be a couple of days here and there where I do some maths problems, but mostly 80% of my studying, 85% of my studying was timed practice questions. I also used every social opportunity to flesh out my essay ideas. So anytime I'd see a friend for lunch or coffee, we would like talk about these like big issues that I was um, coming across during my studies. And it was really, really fun and interesting because everyone, everyone likes talking about the GAMSAT sort of topics. You don't normally get to ruminate on the things that you do ruminate on when you are studying for the GAMSAT. So it's pretty enjoyable and um, it was good to get other perspectives on that as well. And that really helped me write better essays. I would also say limit the amount of time that you spend revising for section one, because I don't think that you can actually improve that much by studying the questions so do, do, do practice timed questions, but I wouldn't allocate time 33% section one, 33% section two, 33% section three. I would allocate my study time probably 20% section one, 50% section two, and then 30% section three. And I think that way you'll get the best bang for your buck. How to achieve a competitive GPA. The holy grail advice for getting a good GPA is don't fall behind. So. What I did to achieve my GPA is watch all my lectures twice the week they came out and then I would binge watch them all again closer to the exam during SWOT back. I also printed off all my assignment rubrics and had them with me when I was doing the assignment. So every step of the way I was dissecting the assignment rubric. I also spent at least between 10 minutes and an hour making sure all my assignments looked incredibly aesthetically pleasing because I do believe that if you spend the extra time to do that, the markers will just mark you nicer because it looks as though you've put in a lot of effort, which is true. If you've spent an hour formatting your assignment, you probably have put an extra effort into making it look special. How early should I start preparing if I'm a first year undergrad? If you haven't got a job, I do advise that you do that ASAP, even though it may feel like you don't have the time to do it. Those skills are just as valuable as the grades that you're getting in your course. The earliest you can sit the GAMSAT, so it's still valid um, at the end of your undergrad degree, is at the start of second year. So that's the earliest you can sit it. But also to answer this question a bit better, how old are you? Because if you have gone straight from high school to university and you're now studying to do medicine, I highly, highly, highly suggest slash beg you, please take some time off during your degree now or after you complete your degree and just be a hedonist, be selfish, enjoy your 20s because you only get your 20s once. Medicine is a very serious degree. You have a lot of responsibility and it forces you to grow up almost immediately. I'm so thankful that I had all of those years of being a silly clown, doing whatever I wanted to do because I just can't do that now if I wanna be a good doctor and I'm okay with that because I've already done it. Don't overlook the fact that once you have duty of care, 
once you actually know how to look after someone in an emergency situation, that doesn't go away. You are always gonna have that duty of care because you have the knowledge, you can't unlearn it. So maximize on the time that you don't have that so that when you do have that responsibility, it doesn't feel like a burden, it feels like something that you chose to do. Was studying ever a complete grind or was I able to learn passively? So when I first went to university straight out of high school, yes, it was such a grind. I was so not into it. I didn't want to go to class. Nothing about studying appealed to me at that point. After I got kicked out of university, I had a few years where I just worked and enjoyed my life and enjoyed existing and not having responsibility and really milked that. After a few years of that, I got bored of doing that and then I started to really miss learning. So after that experience, after I'd had time to miss studying, it never felt like a grind to me ever again and it still doesn't. If you're feeling like it is a grind for you right now, defer. If I could build a time machine and go back in time and give myself one piece of advice, it is defer, 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 defer. You have nothing to lose by deferring a year unless you're an idiot and you buy into that bullshit narrative that society tries to shove down our throats about how taking time off from university to live your life is called wasting a year. There's no such thing as wasting a year. Thank you so much for stopping by today. I hope you enjoyed this video and I hope you learned something about how to get into medicine. And if you did, it would be awesome if you could like this video and comment below because it helps YouTube know that this is a good video. Thanks for your time today and I will see you next time I post and take care of yourself till then.